Good afternoon. Today's legislative hearing focuses on two important public safety bills, S-465, Building Agency Data Gaps and Ensuring Safety Badges for Native Communities Act introduced by Senators Cortez Masto and Senator Hoven, and S-2695, Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act introduced by Senators Cantwell and Mullen. Uh, each bill addresses key areas of need, addressing the missing and murdered indigenous people crisis and improving tribal law enforcement officer recruitment and retention in Indian country. We heard just how critical these needs are at our public safety listening session last month. Over 600 people listened in and commenters overwhelmingly listed MMIP and law enforcement officer recruitment and retention challenges as among their top priorities. S-465 will help to address this crisis in a number of ways, primarily by increasing tribal access to the national missing and unidentified missing person system, uh, unidentified person system and improving systems for collecting and sharing criminal justice data in Indian country. This legislation would also help to address Indian country's unmet need for tribal law enforcement officers by authorizing the BIA to conduct its own background checks and provide culturally appropriate mental health services to address officer burnout. S-2695 would address the challenges of tribal law enforcement, officer recruitment and retention by authorizing officers acting under tribe 638 contract or compact to enforce federal law within the tribe's jurisdiction and make them eligible for federal benefits, including death and injury, retirement and pension benefits. I'd like to extend my welcome to the testifiers today. And we will, um, If are there any opening statements from the uh, members of the committee? Mr. Chairman, if I could just submit uh, something for the record, I do want to express my thanks for Tulalip Pre uh, Police Chief Chris Sutter for being here. He has served the Tulalips for, uh, since 2019, so 26 years. We're going to hear a lot about the challenges on the I-5 corridor, and I'll submit the rest of my um, statement for the record. But clearly, Indian country needs more help in law enforcement, so thank you. And I thank my colleague from Oklahoma for working with me on this very important legislation. Senator Mullen. And I'd like to thank my colleague as well as working together. It's something that brings us all together is with the Indian country. Uh, I, I, you know, Indian country has its own challenges, and obviously sovereignty is a big issue. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of crime that's taking place right now. And we're asking our tribal law enforcement to do the federal government's job. And if we're going to do that uh, and we're going to cross-deputize them or whatever we're going to do with them, then, then we should at least give them the opportunity to have the same benefits. If they're going to do the job, they should have the same benefits. And that's what this, this that, that's what we're talking about here uh, with the uh, uh, Purity Act, or per, per, what's the word I'm looking for there? Parity Act. Um, and, and so I don't think it's controversial. Uh, while we're waiting on the administration to, and I would say, get their act together, as we're acting, as we're asking the tribal law enforcement to do their job, let's just say, hey, listen, if you're going to do their job, let's get the same benefits as a federal officer. So I don't know if we're going to get, and we shouldn't get any pushback on this. We look forward to hearing from our witnesses on this, obviously. But I think this is a common sense piece of legislation that's brought the Republicans and Democrats alike together. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Senator Mullen. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also want to thank you and the ranking member for holding this hearing on our bills today. One of them is the Badges for Native American uh, Communities Act that Senator Hoven and I have introduced. It's one we have seen before. Uh, this is important uh, for so many within our Native American communities when it comes to supporting our law enforcement officers there who are severely hindered. Uh, in their ability to address the crisis of not just uh, MMIW, but drug trafficking, other violent crimes that is devastating our tribes. This legislation, this bipartisan legislation, would support BIA law enforcement recruitment and retention, uh, while also improving our response to the missing persons cases and increasing resources for tribal law enforcement. I can't stress enough, we have heard so often how BIA is understaffed and under-resourced, and we need to provide these essential resources. So. Uh, I look forward to the, the hearing on, on the uh, Badges Act as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Any other uh, opening remarks? Uh, if not, we'll uh, welcome our witnesses. First, we have uh, the Honorable Brian Newland. Spends a lot of time with us, and we appreciate it. The Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. Um, we're also pleased to welcome uh, the Honorable Mark Macaro, President of the National Congress of American Indians. We really appreciate your work for your own tribe, but for Indian country 
uh, overall. And Mr. Chris Sutter, welcome. The Chief of Police of Tulalip uh, Tribal uh, Police Department in Tulalip, Washington. Um, I want to remind our witnesses that your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record, which is our polite way of saying please be five minutes or, or less. Uh, so, uh, Assistant Secretary, Secretary Newland, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got the memo on the time, too. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman and uh, Vice Chair Murkowski, members of the committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present the Department of the Interior's views on this legislation today, S-465 and S-2695. The Department supports S-2695, and we support the goals of S-465, the Bridging Agency Data Gaps and Ensuring Safety for Native Communities Act. We have to defer to the Department of Justice on provisions in that bill pertaining to its programs. S-465 and 2695 align with important administration priorities to improve public safety and justice in Indian country. The United States has a trust relationship and a trust responsibility to each of the 574 federally recognized tribes. And this relationship charges the United States with the highest obligation to protect the physical safety and well-being of Indian tribes, as well as Indian and Alaska Native people. The Bureau of Indian Affairs plays a crucial role in meeting this obligation. We support increased investment in tribal justice systems, and especially for tribal law enforcement officers. S-465 amends the annual reporting requirement in the Indian Law Enforcement Reform Act to include the staffing needs for criminal investigators, medical examiners, coroners, and forensic investigators. It also requires adding the infrastructure and capital needs for tribal police and court facilities, such as evidence storage and processing, to the required data for the annual report. There's a funding and staffing gap that must be addressed to guarantee that tribal justice systems can fully serve their communities. Adding data on the need for criminal investigators, medical examiners, cor coroners, and forensic investigators will demonstrate how important these positions are to tribes. S-465 would also establish a five-year demonstration program that allows the BIA, Office of Justice Services, to speed up background investigations and security clearance processes for law enforcement officers. Currently, our Office of Justice Services assists tribes in conducting background investigations for tribal law enforcement positions. And we welcome the demonstration program and strongly support this provision. Section 204 of that bill establishes counseling resources to maintain the mental health and wellness of BIA and tribal law enforcement officers. Tribal law enforcement officers often respond to dangerous situations that can cause traumatic stress. These much needed resources would help ensure access to important mental health resources for job related stress. S-2695 amends the Indian Law Enforcement Reform Act to allow tribal law enforcement officers acting under the tribe's contract or compact to enforce federal law within their reservation and jurisdiction. To exercise this authority, tribal officers must complete training and background requirements that are equivalent to employees of BIA law enforcement. This bill also makes those tribal law enforcement officers eligible for federal law enforcement benefits, including retirement, pension, death, and injury benefits. The department believes that extending these federal benefits to tribal law enforcement officers will help tribes recruit and retain officers, which will lead to improved public safety. Secretary Holland has made improving public safety in Indian country and addressing the missing and murdered indigenous peoples crisis a top priority for the department. The department supports the goals of these bills, and we look forward to working with the committee and Congress to continue to address public safety needs in Indian country. I want to thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Mr. Makaro, please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and all the members of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. Honored to be here today. My name is Mark Macaro. I'm the Chairman of the Pechanga Band of Indians in California, and I also have the honor of serving as President of the National Congress of American Indians. On behalf of NCAI, I want to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on Senate Bill 465, the Badges for Native, Native Communities Act, and Senate Bill 2695, the Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act. 
two bills that address important public safety concerns in our communities. As I testified before you today, during the National Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Relatives Week of Action, I can think of no better action on behalf of our murdered and missing relatives than to support the passage of these two bills. There are crisis level unmet funding and resource needs across Indian country in law enforcement, tribal courts, victim services and healthcare, including access to behavioral health services, just to name a few. These exist in part because tribal nation governments are the only sovereigns in this country that cannot fully prosecute and, and imprison all of the criminals jeopardizing safety in our own territories. In addition, there's a massive shortage of resources for public safety in native communities. In February of this year, the BIA Office of Justice Programs released a report that noted public safety in Indian country was only being funded at 13% of the quantifiable need. The combined results of constraints on our sovereignty coupled with massive needs in funding and resources has produced communities which are disproportionately affected by violence. The American Indian and Alaskan Native rates of murder, rape, and violent crime are all higher than the national averages for other groups. Innovative solutions are needed to address these ongoing public safety issues. I believe that the two pieces of legislation that are the focus of this hearing have a real chance to positively impact tribal nations. The Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act offers an opportunity to help bridge the law enforcement gap in tribal communities. If passed, the law would impact tribal nations that have contracts or compacts pursuant to the Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act, allowing for tribal control of any or all law enforcement functions. For tribal nations with contracts or compacts, tribal police who meet certain qualifications would be, eligible, would be able to enforce federal law within the tribal nation's jurisdiction. Such a possibility could significantly increase the effectiveness of law enforcement and safety in our communities. Also of critical importance, the statute would deem a tribal law enforcement officer as a federal law enforcement officer for the purposes of certain federal laws, including for injury and death, retirement and pension benefits, if they are acting under such an authorized compact or contract. Now, turning our attention to S-465, the Badges for Native Communities Act, it takes several much needed actions to improve data collection and dissemination regarding public safety in Native communities. According to the National Crime Information Center, in 2016, there were 5,712 reports of missing American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls, but only 116 cases were logged within the uh, National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. Under S-465, a tribal facilitator would be appointed to coordinate missing and unidentified persons cases with tribal nations and provide training and technical assistance to tribal nations, tribal organizations, victim service advocates, coroners, and tribal justice officials on how to report and utilize the system. Until the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System adequately accounts for American Indian and Alaska Native victims, we will never know the scope of the problem or how to fix it. In sum, I want to again express NCAI's support for the passage of both S-465 and S-2695. If passed, these two bills will be an important step in addressing systemic inequalities that permeate public safety throughout our communities. And they will help in measure with the United States government's trust and treaty obligations to the United, to tribal nations in the United States. I want to thank everybody on this committee for the invitation to speak here today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. As you can see, we're in the middle of vote, so uh, senators will be coming and going. Chief uh, Sutter, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and members of the committee. My name is Chris Sutter, and I'm the Chief of Police for the Tulalip Tribes. I'm pleased to testify today on behalf of the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians in support of S-2695, the Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act. The Parity Act would allow tribal officers to participate in the federal retirement and benefits programs that federal officers currently enjoy. This would provide a significant and immediate positive recruitment and retention impact on at &I member tribes and Indian tribes nationally. For years, tribes have recruited, trained new officers only to see them leave for law enforcement positions with state and county and municipal police departments that offer more attractive benefits. 
Indian tribes face unique challenges providing law enforcement services to their tribal communities compared to non-Indian enforcement de uh, law enforcement departments. In recent years, Tulalip has lost 50% of our officer workforce due to recruitment by other local law enforcement agencies, putting extreme strain on our, on our operations. While I ask, when I ask my fellow officers why they're leaving, 90% of the time the answer is for a retirement pen, uh, pension plan. This is not a unique um, pattern to Tulalip. I serve on the International Association of Chiefs of Police Indian Country Section Committee. At a recent meeting, the committee identified recruitment, hiring, and retention of officers as one of our biggest challenges that impact the tribe's ability to address our law enforcement needs. There are many negative consequences when we lose officers to other jurisdictions. One of the consequences is financial. When tribes hire new officers, they will uh, complete the BIA Indian Police Academy and possibly other state law enforcement academies at a significant cost. Best practices usually require approximately one year on the job before they're able to respond to routine calls on their own. The Tulalip Tribal Police Department invests more than $130,000 for training and salaries for new hires in their first year. When they leave, we have to pay these costs again and it takes months to find a qualified candidate as we have to compete with local jurisdictions for the same candidates. Other consequences is the failure to maintain community relations. There's often a deep level of mistrust between law enforcement and tribal members who live on res Indian reservations. In the past, calling a non-tribal police department for emergency assistance often led to re-victimization if there was any response at all. We simply cannot be effective in carrying out our duties when we don't know the community and the community doesn't know us. Also, when officers leave their jobs for neighboring jurisdictions, it negatively impacts the tribe's ability to provide specialty policing services and carry out complex investigations. The fentanyl epidemic has become one of the most critical issues in tribal, uh, tribal communities and investigating and preparing cases that the U.S. Attorney's Office will prosecute requires experienced personnel. MMIP and Violence Against Women Act cases also require experienced officers and detectives who have established trust and rapport with the tribal communities that they serve. Again, officer turnover impairs tribes' ability to address these and other crimes that require experienced personnel. We need this legislation passed to increase our ability to retain trained and skilled police officers, which will help us provide public safety for both tribal and non-tribal persons in our community. Tribal police officers are putting their lives on the line every day to protect their tribal communities. These duties often include apprehending armed drug traffickers and other violent criminals perform and performing the work, the public safety work of the federal government. Tribal officers currently perform these duties without the same benefits that federal officers receive. The Parity Act would change this and put tribal officers on the same benefit level as federal officers. ATNI urges the committee to take whatever steps are necessary to ensure its enactment into law as soon as possible. We look forward to continuing to work with the committee on this important national issue. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, and thank you to the panel of witnesses today. We will begin now with the questions from the Senate committee members. Uh, Senator Lujan. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. Uh, Chief Sutter, in your written testimony, you highlighted an ongoing problem in Indian country where tribes will train and recruit officers who work for the tribe for a short period of time only to leave for other jurisdictions with better benefits. One of the effects of such high turnover is failure to maintain continuity and community relations. In turn, officers are unable to carry out complex investigations such as drug trafficking or cases of missing and murdered indigenous persons. Chief Sutter, can you elaborate on how a high turnover rates hamstring the ability of tribal law enforcement to effectively crack down on fentanyl trafficking? 
The fentanyl epidemic has hit Indian country very hard, uh, at least five times greater uh, than the percentage of the non-tribal community. We've lost many, many tribal members to this epidemic. Uh, to combat these illegal organized criminal organizations importing fentanyl onto reservations, it take, it's staffing uh, heavy. We, we have had to form our own drug task force uh, we have to have trained, experienced officers with the department to be able to fill those specialty positions to really uh, address the fentanyl epidemic. And so uh, I believe that this Parity Act will greatly help with our retention, which will also then help stabilize our workforce and provide experienced trained officers to then provide that specialty high level um, detective work that's required. I appreciate that, sir. Uh, President Macaro. Back in March, I led a letter to the Department of Justice on the high rates of tribal prosecutorial declinations. According to the Justice Department's own findings, Native American women are two to three times more likely than women of any other race to experience violence, stalking, or sexual assault. Yet the department declines to prosecute about half of those cases. One provision of the Badges Act would increase tribal access to the national missing and unidentified person system by requiring tribal facilitators to conduct ongoing tribal outreach and serve as a point of contact for tribes and law enforcement agencies. Tribal facilit I am not having luck with that word today. Um, would also be required to conduct training and information gathering to improve the resolution of missing persons uh, cases in order to uh, collaborate more. President Makaru, can you tell me more about the benefits of having a tribal um, collaboration initiative working with family members and tribes? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, as I mentioned briefly in my previous remarks, data from 2016 showed that only about 2% of reporting American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls were actually logged within NamUs, uh, the National Missing and Unidentified, Unidentified Person System. So under the proposed badges bill, a tribal facilitator would be appointed to coordinate missing and unidentified, unidentified persons cases with tribal nations and provide training and technical assistance to tribal nations, tribal organizations, victim service advocates, coroners, and tribal justice officials on how to report and utilize the system. The additional capacity provided by the tribal facilitator will first and foremost help to adequately account for the actual number of American Indian and Alaska Native victims, which then can help inform future policy decisions about where to allocate resources to try and protect our communities better. Now, the tribal facilitator position through its coordinating duties can also assist in the, in, in the sharing of information between tribal nations, the federal government, and other relevant agencies, services, and their databases, the importance of having dedicated staff to assist in such coordination efforts has the potential to greatly impact our collective long-term effectiveness in dealing with the MMIP crisis. I also want to note then that the uh, tribal facilitator will also help with unidentified and unclaimed remains cases of interest to tribal nations to help identify deceased and return them to their tribal homelands so that they may be buried with their ancestors. In many reported incidents, the pain of losing a loved one was exacerbated by improper or culturally insensitive treatment of the case or remains. While preventing the occurrence of MMIP should be the primary goal, further steps must be taken to ensure that when crimes occur, both families and the victims are supported in a culturally appropriate way. The tribal facilitator provided, provided for in the Badges Act would likely help reduce culturally insensitive incidents like the one I've just mentioned. Thank you. I very much appreciate that, President Macaro. Um, Assistant Secretary Newell, it takes me to my next question. So mm -hmm. in November, the Not Invisible Act Commission published recommendations on how to increase intergovernmental coordination to address the missing and murdered indigenous persons crisis. The commission found that there is limited data being shared between the Department of Justice, the Department of Interior, and other federal agencies like DHS and the FBI. This can lead to demographic miscalculations and consistent practices in collecting tribal affiliation and general underreporting of the crime. In March, I asked the Department of Justice what their policy is for coordinating and information sharing with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. 
I'm still waiting for that response. So I hope they're, they're tuning in today. Um, but I'd like to ask you a similar question. My, my question, Assistant Secretary Newland, is how would you characterize coordination and communication between the DOJ and DOI on missing and murdered indigenous person crisis? And where's there room for improvement? Thank you, Senator. There's always room uh, to do better. Uh, clearly, the numbers show that. Uh, what I can say is that we've, uh, we've taken some concrete steps to make sure that we are coordinating. One of the things we've done is execute a, an interagency agreement between the FBI and the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, for the first time in more than 30 years. Uh, that's, uh, that agreement uh, lays out some of the details about how FBI and BI law enforcement will coordinate on cases, including uh, some issues relating to data reporting. Um, up at, at, at my level and with our team uh, uh, in departmental leadership uh, from Department of Justice, we have regular meetings um, on MMIP, MMIW issues and the work that we're doing, and we coordinated the response to the Not Invisible Act Commission uh, together, hand in hand. Um, th there are a lot of challenges on the ground when it comes to reporting data. A lot of uh, a lot of the things that that you hear, Senator, um, that are you know challenges that people just it aren't always. It isn't always intuitive about who's who's native and who isn't, um, and some people don't know to remember to answer that or ask that question. And that, may, that also leads to some data issues. Um, and there are things that you know, we're trying to do to, to um, make sure we're coordinating better with Department of Justice on that. So we formalized our relationship or renewed that formalization. Uh, we're talking at leadership levels um, and making this a priority, but um, I, I do think this legislation will help. There was a train derailment in New Mexico recently, uh, a few days ago. If I could ask one question to Chief Sutter. So over the weekend, a freight train carrying propane derailed and caught fire and exploded near Gallup, New Mexico, um, partly on the Navajo Nation. Nearby residents were forced to evacuate their homes. Now, Gallup is right on the edge of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico, and this was on the New Mexico-Arizona border, so Navajo Nation in New Mexico and in Arizona. Um, now, some nearby did not receive any sort of emergency alert on their phones. Now, we, we've been trying to get this straightened out for missing and murdered within the Department of Justice, within the FCC. Legislation has been passed, has been sent to the president, but now we have another derailment carrying propane, explosions, things were caught on fire, and there were efforts to evacuate. Yes or no, on a macro level, are there adequate resources for tribal communities to communicate and issue emergency alerts during crisis? No, with a lot of room for improvement. I appreciate that very much and look forward to working with the committee leadership uh, to get this addressed. Thank you. Senator, uh, thank you, because you uh, uh, highlighted some important issues that we still need to focus on. Obviously, there's gaps in data gathering and information sharing, uh, and I appreciate um, your, your comments. Um, I also appreciate uh, Assistant Secretary Newland because I'm going I'm to focus on you right now. As you well know, the Not Invisible Act, uh, there was a report that came from it that Senator Ben Ray um, talked about, and there were recommendations in that report. Some of them administratively can be um, implemented, but uh, some of them are requiring congressional action. Uh, I actually have legislation that I'm looking at right now implementing some of those recommendations but I, the Badges Act will address some of that data gathering. Isn't that correct? I believe so, Senator, yes. And let me ask you this on just a, a separate subject as we talk about the, the Badges Act. As you know, and you touched on this a little bit, the extended waiting period that BIA law enforcement officers face during their background checks oftentimes deters applicants from even going through the process. I hear this constantly in, in the state of Nevada as well. And the Badges Act would create that five-year demonstration uh, program that would allow BIA to adjudicate their own background checks for officer candidates. 
Assistant Secretary, do you support this program? And can you speak to how this will help improve that officer recruitment? Absolutely. Uh, I support uh, this this pilot project, Senator. And, and uh, you know, it's always difficult when uh, when you're trying to carry out your mission, uh, when you are dependent on somebody else uh, to complete your mission. And that's where we're at uh, when it comes to background checks, because we have not been able to do that ourselves. And so allowing us to, to have ownership of this process and making sure that, you know, the buck stops with us. Um, I think we'll also in, in the fact that Indian Affairs mission is is narrower than um, some of the other folks who do these background checks will allow us to be more efficient and speedy with it. Would this somehow uh, lower that threshold for somebody to overcome a background check no. or, or, or security background or clearance just because BIA is, is providing this no. background? No, no. Um, let me ask you this. The Badges Act would seek to evaluate federal law enforcement practices for handling and processing evidence in cases in Indian country. Um, this was one of the issues that comes up over and over again uh, when we try to dig into why so many violent crimes against Native people aren't prosecuted. Can you talk about the long-term impact in a tribal community when serious crime goes unprosecuted? Well, Senator, I I see I've got two and a half minutes. Uh, I could probably speak at great length about this. Um, you know, I th I, in a lot of communities that I've visited in, in this job and, and, and colleagues I've spoken to when I served in, in tribal leadership, um, it, you know, one of the things that it, uh, I hear a lot of is that people seem to know that there's no accountability if they come into tribal communities and commit bad acts. And so people who are intent on uh, carrying out violence or, or sexual abuse or domestic violence know that their odds of, of getting away with it are higher in Indian country. And when we don't prosecute these cases and we don't make them a priority, uh, it sends that signal to people who are intent on doing harm, but Senator, it also sends a signal to people who live in those communities and people across Indian country that uh, your safety and your well-being and your lives matter less. And uh, I don't think that that's consistent with our trust obligation uh, to Indian people. Um, and when we're, uh, when we're not prosecuting cases in Indian country that we prosecute elsewhere, it's, it says a lot. And, um, you know, that's something we're all committed, I think, to improving. And then finally, uh, we all know this, and, and there was mention of this, but I hear this constantly, uh, BAI, uh, BIA law enforcement staffing shortage. It, it's there. It's, it, there's a challenge here. Um, and um, it's caused by a number of issues, uh, we know, um, from a lack of federal support to the unique challenges facing officers in rural communities. Um, again, the Badges Act would help hopefully address that shortage. But with a BIA shortage, let me ask um, Chief Sutter, you've seen this uh, in communities. Not every, lawn, not every Native American community has the opportunity to hire their own law enforcement task force. Some have to rely on BIA as the only source of law enforcement. And if they are understaffed and they have a large geographic area, to cover, it's pretty much guaranteed they're not going to be able to cover all of the, the crime that happens. I'm curious um, how you have addressed some of the communities in your state that don't actually have a law enforcement and your work with BIA. In the Pacific Northwest, we only have one BIA agent assigned to a drug task force, and we have 29 federally recognized tribes in the state. We have neighboring tribes uh, close to Tulalip, that have had uh, so many drug over, overdose deaths and uh, cartels bringing drugs on their reservation that we offer mutual aid support between the tribes, but the staffing and the critical shortage of officers makes it very, very difficult. This is a very real problem, this uh, officer staffing issue at both at the BIA and for those that contract or compact uh, to provide our own tribal law enforcement services. Thank you. I, I appreciate the testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions for Secretary Newland. Uh, 
Tell me how a tribal facilitator will help BIA to officers to solve MMIP cases. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, the the first thing is is we, this has been much discussed at this hearing is is that it will make sure that we're getting accurate data, and it helps you um, connect cases that might be connected. Um, more information is always helpful to investigators, um, and it will also, I think, better connect Indian Country uh, with the Department of Justice and with us on these cases. We've been working actually with the Department of Justice on, on NamUs-related issues in, in two instances. But I think filling those data gaps will help our investigators uh, serve Indian country. You just answered my second question um, I'm very efficiently. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, look, these are, these are really good bills. They're bipartisan bills. They're logical bills. And a lot of times when a, when a bill is not controversial, that almost means it's small. It's almost a signifier that it's not a big deal. Um, but this is the sweet spot in legislating. This is both a big deal and will make a real impact, but it's also not a subject of terrible controversy. And so I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to mark these up and, um, and enact them into law. So thank you very much. If there are no more questions, questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will be open for two weeks, and I want to thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony. This hearing is adjourned.